Welcome. I'm Michelle Elam, professor in the English department and faculty associate director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, or HI as we call it. And on behalf of HI, we're absolutely delighted to host for the HI community both a special pre-screening and now conversation about coded bias. And the film, for those who are able to watch it prior to today, explores the social impact of powerful, largely unregulated technologies, such as facial recognition technology, or FRT, and by extension, that broader cluster of exponential technologies that they're usually referred to under the umbrella term AI. And over the last week, those of you who are able to sign up had the opportunity to watch the documentary in advance. But if you haven't yet, it's okay. It will be released on, I think it's Netflix in the next month or so. So we hope our conversation today only whets your appetite for it. We are especially honored to have the very rare opportunity to bring together in conversation here, the director and producer herself, Shalini Kataya, as well as Fei-Fei Li, Sequoia Professor of Computer Science at Stanford, co-director of Hi, and co-founder of AI for All, which is a nonprofit working to increase diversity and inclusion in the field of artificial intelligence. So this discussion is especially unique since we have the artist who made the film, we have the scientist who actually knows what facial recognition tech is, what it does or doesn't do, and me as a humanist scholar whose contribution is basically us asking a lot of questions, not just about the social and political implications of this work, but also about the ways we represent these debates, how cultural storytelling and narrative shape and enlarge and sometimes constrict our collective understanding of technologies that have such an outsized impact and reach in every aspect of our public and private lives. So we have a hard stop at 445, so let me jump right in since I know both have much to say about the ethics and application of these AI technologies, and I'm gonna be integrating audience questions throughout. But before we delve into the issues raised in the film, which opens with the personal journey of MIT researcher and self-described poet of code, Joy Bulamwini, in exposing racial and gender bias in algorithms, I wanna ask Fei Fei, this kind of question that is so obvious that we almost never hear it asked, either in the public square or maybe some are too embarrassed to ask, or academic conferences on the topic where maybe our colleagues take too much for granted in thinking there's a shared vocabulary or understanding about how to frame it. So Fei Fei, can you just give us a frame for understanding just what FRT is and, and why it matters? Because it opens the film with Joy's face only being recognized by facial recognition when she puts on a white mask, but the workings of FRT aren't really ever explained. Sure, so first of all, uh, thank you, Michelle, for the invitation, and really what a pleasure to meet you, Shalini. Uh, I watched uh, this film with my family and uh, highly recommend to all the audience out there when it's available, please uh, watch it. Uh, so, um, yes, um, I'm, I'm a computer vision scientist and uh, computer vision is part of AI and it's a very vast field. And face recognition or sometimes called facial recognition, uh, FRT is a sub area of computer vision field. I actually personally didn't work in FRT, but um, we've studied this since I was a graduate student. Let me just uh, say from a scientist technologist point of view that this is a tool and like all tools, it is a double-edged sword. It can be used for good and for bad. FRT is also a very interesting tool because it mirrors a special capability of humans and uh, intelligent animals. In 1990s, um, neuroscientists have found there are special areas in our human brain that specializes for face recognition, whether it's recognizing there's a face in the wild or recognizing specific people. And that capability seemed to be reserved for very intelligent uh, animals. And uh, because of this important, and, and partially probably because we're social animals and recognizing faces is very important. So translating to the domain of computer vision, FRT is kind of an umbrella term that covers related technology for let's say detecting faces. So not necessarily recognizing it's Michelle or Shalini uh, uh, face, but knowing there is a face in, in the environment, all the way to um, 
identifying individual faces, their identities, all the way to recognizing the emotions and, and more subtle aspects uh, of a face. And they're all part of the FRT uh, technology. And uh, Michelle, I'm sure we'll dive into this. Um, some of the FRT technology is already being used, whether you recognize or not. For example, your digital cameras and cell phones, when they take pictures, FRT technology is quietly working so that the camera can automatically uh, focus on, on faces and make uh, the pictures better on faces compared to a flower. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people use FRT technology to um, uh, open their, their, unlock their phone. Personally, um, I'm most excited to see this technology potentially being used in, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to dive into that later. Yeah, uh, I mean, it would be helpful if you you mentioned to me a story where it was helpful in um, diagnosing or treating, was it stroke victims? Uh, yes, actually, that's one, um, um, you know, when I, w we work in different aspects of health care, uh, one of the area is ambulatory emergency response to potential stroke patients. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, um, you know, there are, this is not mature technology, but I know that there are technologists and clinicians looking at the possibility of using phone as simple as phone apps to recognize the kind of facial features that are important and clinically relevant to early stroke detection. Mm -hmm. Or um, even in the hospital system, pain level mm -hmm. assessment for patients is actually critical in many cases for their treatment and recovery. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that uh, FRT technology can become very useful for um, clinicians to keep, a, keep an eye, quote unquote, mm -hmm. on um, the continuous mm -hmm. changing nature of a patient's pain level. Yeah, thank you so much, Feifei, because I feel like that framing is really helpful to keep in mind because the film definitely, and totally rightly just emphasizes the profound risks of facial mm -hmm. recognition driven only by like imperatives of power and profit. But your description, I think really takes us beyond the apocalyptic or utopian narratives that either declare tech is evil or conversely, the answer to all of the world's woes. Because as someone who studies literature, I'm always cautious about the narratives that pose that kind of either or, mostly because it seems like a grotesque failure of imagination to only know and only, only hear those storylines. It makes it actually harder to clearly interpret and address the actual risks and possibilities. So with Fei Fei's settler character, of AA in, in mind, let me ask Shalini about your modest storytelling about the impact of FCT, because I was really struck by um, FRC, sorry, FRT. I'll stop with the acronyms, it's a Stanford thing. <laughs> I was struck by how your documentary goes really well beyond the focus of one person, as important and influential as Joy is. Um, and I really was struck by how you showcase and um, give voice really to the experiences of others. You know, there, there's the Brooklyn low-income housing resident, there's the member of the UK parliament, there's events at scale like the Facebook experiment to get out the vote that revealed how easy it would be to sway the election. So Shalini, how, can you tell us how and why you selected those disparate stories and what specific messages you were hoping to communicate? Yes, I mean, um, thank you to you and to Stanford for, for hosting a conversation between art, artists and scientists. It's a really exciting space to be in. Um, I came to this work much through joy. I knew nothing about algorithms two years ago. I have no background in um, AI. And it uh, sort of, I become immersed in a character. And I met Joy, and I, fe I found that there was something that was going to happen there. Um, I'm someone who also loves technology, and sort of um, through Joy's story, became interested in sort of what the dark side or the underbelly of the technologies that we're interacting with every day are. And that set me on, on this journey. And I think, you know, the opening scene of the film is, um, you know, her just trying to make an art project work and it not detecting her face. And I think for me, um, as an artist and as someone who, my process is to sort of connect the dots to things that are not seemingly connected. Mm -hmm. So in the film, I try to connect 
the science, which um, to people maybe outside your program can feel quite overwhelming. Um, you all have a power in the knowledge that you have about AI and the systems that are impacting our lives every day that I think the general public still has a big gap in education. And so what I hope to do is, you know, it was so, sort of an overwhelming process for me sitting with people um, as smart as Fei-Fei, there, I think there's seven PhDs in my film, trying to- um, A lot of women. A lot of women also PhDs in the film who, 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 and trying to um, sort of condense their work into sound bites that the public can sort of understand how this science works, but also connect it to what it can mean in society. And for me, I was most interested in who it could hurt and who it could harm mm -hmm. and the stories of harm. And so um, that took me to Big Brother watching UK um, and how these systems were being deployed. And I sort of became interested in um, how these very powerful technologies, um, the impact that they have on our lives and how they get disseminated and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. That's really helpful, especially because you look at so many sectors of people in power and powerless. Um, why don't we look at just one clip? I think we have time for a clip of an incident where, um, I don't know if you want to set it up. It's a it's a young schoolboy, I think he's 13 or 14, who gets pulled over by um, unmarked, unidentified um, police officers. This young black kid in school uniform got stopped as a result of a match. took him down that street just to one side, um, like very thoroughly searched him. It was all plainclothes officers as well. It was four plainclothes officers who stopped him. Fingerprinted him after about like maybe 10, 15 minutes of um, searching and checking his details and fingerprinting him. Um, they came back and said, it's not him. Excuse me, I work for a human rights campaigning organization. We're campaigning against facial recognition technology. We're campaigning against facial, we're called Big Brother Watch. Yeah, we're a human rights campaigning organization. We're campaigning against this technology here today. Um, and then you've just been stopped because of that, but they misidentified you. So I, I, that scene for me is so powerful about what art can do that other genres and modes might not, if you just heard a description of that, because I just find it so poignant and disturbing because in those few seconds, you have a Shalini bear, bearing witness, not just about misrecognition, but about the violation abuses of surveillance, you know, the trauma and public humiliation of this clearly overwhelmed child just as he's coming of age. So even though it's just a few seconds, you know he's probably carrying that experience with him for the rest of his life. Um, and surveillance though is such a complicated issue that we have to touch on and there's several audience questions about it too, because the film also raises this, you know, people of color are both less invisible as in the case of Joy, but are also we know hyper surveilled by tech. So FRT can be used for oppressive purposes, but it also can be turned on those surveilling to unmask power. So I had a question for both Feifei and, and Shalini because this issue of sur uh, surveillance goes directly to recurring ferocious debates about usually framed over individual rights and privacy or public good or innovation or reverses re regulation. Um, and the fact that while social pressure has encouraged several companies to date to press pause on their R&D and sales, and there's a few state laws, there's no federal regulation. There's the 2019 Commercial Re Facial Recognition Privacy Act that was introduced in the Senate in March of last year, but there's been no movement on it since then. So where do you two see the front lines of this unfolding public and political debate? And wh where would you like to see the conversation go? And I pitch it to either one of you. After go ahead, Shalini. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what I can say is this, I we agree in the sense that um, I don't believe that the tools themselves are, are good or bad. I, I do agree that they're uses. My big questions in the film are about who gets to decide by which these very powerful technologies that are designed by a very elite group of people 
get deployed on masses of society. And what I found in the making of this film was essentially terrifying, <laughs> which was that there was no process, that technologies that haven't been vetted for, for racial bias, for gender bias, for even accuracy, are being sold off the shelf to law enforcement and being deployed at scale. And so, you know, uh, you know, just in June, we had this incredible feat, as you said, you had you know, Microsoft and Amazon and other big companies pausing their, their use of it because in part of the research done by Joy and others in my film. But I think it raises a bigger question about what the process should be what, of how these, um, these technologies get deployed at scale. And I'd love to hear what, what Pepe has to say about that as well. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Shalini. I think FRT joins an increasingly growing list of more and more powerful technologies, um, whether it's biometric technology or just personal data technology that is potentially or already infringing on important um, rights like privacy and, and equity and fairness, mm -hmm. right? Uh, unfortunately, FRT is not the first technology as we have, you know, our uh, fingerprints, our biometrics, our location data, our um, you know online behavior data, our clicks and 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 our our purchases—they're all part of this digital fingerprint um, that uh, is becoming, you know, part of a a larger, as you say, powerful, um, you know commercialization or a surveillance system that that uh, poses these critical questions it really the, the way i look at it since i am a scientist and i recognize my lack of expertise and training in thinking about these very deep issues in um with uh, nuanced and and deep uh policy or ethical angles. Uh, so what I feel I can contribute, and this is what Stanford's HAI is doing, is to create a multi-stakeholder platform to engage in a conversation uh, like this. Uh, in a way, your film is doing that too. You 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 bring in different people from different backgrounds, whether it's Joy or Kathy or Zepni. They all have different... Um, um, background to to engage in this conversation. So you know, just a small example. About two months ago, under the leadership of uh, um, um, AI HAI and our um, our faculty leaders from law school and computer science department, we actually had a FRT workshop that created a space to bring ACLU to bring um, federal agency like NIST to bring your uh, members of European Parliament, to bring, um, uh, I, I believe it was Minnesota state uh, uh, policymakers and, and also uh, academians as well as Joy uh, and uh, many people to have this multi-stakeholder conversation to talk about how do we benchmark FRT. This is something, Shalini, you, you highlighted is FRT is a new technology that is not even well benchmarked. And, and yet it's being used. Oh, of course, I missed in our uh, HAI workshop, we brought in also Amazons and Microsoft and Google. And, and um, um, so to create that space that we can have that multi-stakeholder conversation, mm -hmm. eventually this framework's goal is to, to uh, put the guardrails uh, around this technology that can continue to potentially in certain ways, like in healthcare and all, all this to benefit humanity, but to prevent the harm and hurt that you, you talk about and to engage policy making and regulatory measures. So that's, that's yeah. where I hope to see that we, especially at HAI, we can contribute to. That's that's really helpful because uh, Fei-Fei, we've talked a lot about about how you don't see scientists as simply saying we can make it so we should. We have nothing to do with policy. We don't have anything to do with impact. But figuring out where and when and how to participate has always been something 
um, that you always have at the top of mind, I know, in terms, especially around ethics. You know, you, Fefe, you talked about the crucial importance of putting humans at the center of all tech development and design from the outside, from the outset, excuse me. And that seems less common in some STEM fields. Um, I'm wondering, and this comes from an audience question too, if you could tell us more about the importance of the human in the loop, because I heard that also in the conversation about surveillance and also predictive judicial sentencing that humans don't have any control or a hand in it. And one of their questions was, how do we make sure to guide, I think you might've just answered it in part, how do we make sure to guide the tech rather than cede to the pressure to defer to the putatively neutral tech in the name of objectivity or expediency. And I wanna give you an, an example that I hadn't thought about because you, bring, you do bring interdisciplinary perspectives to bear, including social sciences. And a colleague of mine was just on a flight to, um, uh, to go to France actually. And without warning, without consent, she had to go through this whole biometric screening and she had no idea where the where the information was going or what. And, and the way she described it was, am I just gonna hold up this whole line of people behind me? It was a social pressure. It had been normalized as a as a social pressure. And I think that as much as you know, there is a lot of historical and social pressure to defer to putatively neutral tech, even though we know it is not, as you like to say, if you said many times, human machine values are human values. Mm -hmm. But how can we keep you have, I know you have some ideas about how to keep the human in the loop. What would that look like? Yeah, so this is something that at HAI we discuss a lot. I think there are many aspects. HAI itself is founded by three uh, intellectual tenets that uh, connects humans and, and technology like AI, right? The first one is that we recognize that AI, that this technology is no longer a niche computer science discipline that's removed from human impact. In fact, there's so much human and societal uh, implication um, in this technology that we welcome. Sometimes we need to invite the social scientists and humanists to lead the research scholarship and conversation. That's a fine idea. <laughs> <laughs> Here, where uh, Michelle, you're uh, embodiment of that, uh, and and to really understand, to to forecast, and and to guide mm -hmm. the the human and societal impact, whether it's future of work or 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 law or or um, you know ethical guardrails. That's one component of human in the loop. Mm -hmm. Second is uh, something that we talk less about in this film, uh, Shalini, but actually. FRT for me, as well as many AI technology, is part of the loop that we augment human capability, not replace humans. It can be used so positively to enhance. Again, back to the healthcare example, clinicians are worldwide and in our country are so overworked and fatigued. And uh, for us, for clinicians to have a continuous understanding and assessment of a stroke patient's, um, you know, situation or pain <coughs> level, we need that kind of augmented uh, capability to supplement their work. And this is where, whether it's FRT or other kind of technology can help. So that's the human enhancement and augmentation. And and third and, and also very important to HAI's uh, funding principle is to recognize for technology to be human augmenting and to be collaborative, we need a deeper level of technology that we don't have today to uh, to be inspired by human intelligence, to um, be able to understand human emotions and, and human intentions. So all these are aspects of human in the loop technology in terms of um, uh, the, the technology's development and, and, mm -hmm. and research. That's that's helpful. I, I'm sure I haven't seen these questions, but I'm sure somebody's like, but this film is it's very hard to hold those two things simultaneously. How can it actually augment and inspire and actually be um, have such powerful impact? And Shalini, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier, um, because it spoke to, I think, how interesting it is to try and bring people from different perspectives together and have them equal voice. Because you've said before, if I can quote you, out of turn without asking permission, sometimes you find like feel like the creative freak in the room. And I feel like there's often this sense that we have to have a lot of expertise to speak to this. And I think it's really important that you've got um, a lay person's and an artistic perspective on it to bring to bear and also um, Fei Fei's more nuanced technological vision 
um, together. I think that's really helpful. And one of the, the things that both of you mentioned, because um, this came up too, and one of the questions was a reminder that the answer, that accuracy is somehow often uh, thrown out there as the, if we just had more accurate um, or more expansive data sets to feed the algorithms that the answer of bias would be solved. But as you, you know, other people point out that just only increases the reach of oppressive pack practices too. So that, that question of accuracy is really interesting because I think Feifei, you had mentioned too, that um, I know Susan Atley and other people are looking about that accuracy is not simply the answer. And Shalini, even in your example with the, that young man in particular, misrecognition would not have, I mean, if, it had, if he had been properly recognized, it still would have um, indexed the problems with it as well. Both of you have, because I have time is short, I wanted to ask a couple quick things. One, Shalini, you have a list of demands uh, um, and action items in your manifesto action toolkit that individuals can do in the absence or as we're waiting for federal regulation, if it ever happens. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? And then I want to ask Feifei too about in the educational realm, what you're imagining. Yes. And I just want to say my concern is, is that you have a different relationship to the technology as makers of it. For most of us, this technology has absolute authority. If mm -hmm. you say something and a computer says something, well, mm -hmm. you're wrong. <laughs> even, even with your PhD, you're wrong. The computer is right. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a man in Detroit who was um, arrested and detained. It was the first known um, misidentification of, of police use of facial recognition, um, held for 30 hours in a prison cell and never asked for his license because of the, they trusted the facial recognition. Mm -hmm. And even when the technologists do all of their work and don't even sell this technology, um, you know, as something it doesn't do, this, the people actually selling it to the commercial market may misuse it. There may be abuses. People were, were feeding um, pictures of Woody Harrelson in, uh, to substitute for police subs, um, suspects as a way of, um, and so there is this, even if the technology is perfect, the, um, the sort of potential for a misuse by people who aren't technologists is still there. And so it is my strong feeling, um, my strong belief that we actually need a system, much like the FDA, that um, puts some guardrails in place. Um, my mantra is sort of, don't leave the tech bros alone on this stuff, which which is sort of about both like what you're saying, have an ethicist in the room, have other people in the room um, that know about the humanities. We're thinking up that Black Mirror episode that can happen. Um, but also once the technology is being deployed to protect us from abuse, we actually need laws. And so um, we saw for the first time uh, technology companies putting down this invasive surveillance, making the connection between racially biased technology and uh, the harm that's done to, um, to black life and making those connections. And um, it's my belief that we actually need laws in place. And you see local um, San Francisco and Oakland, their police departments in the few that are technology hubs where people understand how this technology works have been the first to ban these technologies in their police departments and in their universities. And I think that shows us how um, there needs to be a system in place. So I am in, in, in favor of a of, of, of federal ban on facial recognition until those safeguards are in place to ensure much like pharmaceuticals, that this stuff doesn't hurt people. Of course, pharmaceuticals have the capacity for good. The fact that I want an FDA does not mean I don't like food. It means that I believe in a certain standard of safety for all um, for all technology. Yeah, I think, well, you mentioned, I, I think one of the things that was important that people have pointed out that it's really good that the private, sec private sector is taking note, big companies, but it's usually often these smaller companies that are actually um, selling and marketing the material. So that's another debate that comes up a lot is what's the technologist's responsibility once it's out in the wild. I actually am so, I, uh, this isn't just a plug for high, but I feel like these conversations about so we don't demonize one group or another and actually think together about um, uh, uh, making sure 
that there's not just harm, but there's also ability to do good is just so incredibly important. But when I'd ask you the question too, you have a very long, like several page list of things that individuals can do, which I thought was very empowering. Um, besides just having ethicists in the room or, you know, have a seat at the table. But, um, I don't know if you want to mention just a couple of those too, because I think that yeah. also was a way of feeling like you could actually do something. Well, I think the first thing that we can do is a, a ban on facial recognition in our universities and our schools and um, biometric data. You said it's like your fingerprint, but if you actually have a have your fingerprint taken, there's a law that says how your fingerprint can be taken. Um, I think we can um, support for the first time ever. We have a, a federal ban uh, proposed on facial recognition used by federal law enforcement, which means we wouldn't be able to sell it to, to ICE and to the FBI, and I, I, I really think that we should all be supporting those bans. Um, if you go to coded bias backslash uh, take action, there's a whole bunch of um, great organizations doing work in the field to make sure that these very techn great technologies that can be used for good also don't infringe on our civil rights. Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful. And then Fei Fei, you also, in terms of, I mean, um, the university is not technically an activist or ag a, uh, advocacy organization, but I know at, at the level of curriculum, embedded ethics curriculum and others, and um, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that. And, and, a, um, and AI for All actually is a K through 12 sort of program, because that those seem like complementary efforts. Yes, well. so so one thing I want to comment on what Shalane is talking about, I know you passionately talk about law. One thing I see that's a really increasing trend here, at least at Stanford and, and probably um, out, also outside, is actually the increasing interest of legal scholars uh, and, and technology. So HAI has a number of legal scholars working as leaders and participants in looking at this. So I know a law or a regulatory effort doesn't just take legal scholars, it takes civil society and policymakers right. and, and people like you, but at least I think it's an exciting growing area of efforts. and. I just want to comment on that. And uh, as Michelle, you said, in addition to this uh, important work um, as an educator, um, both living in higher ed, but as well as with K-12 education effort, I really, really do believe that education is is really one of the most important component of what you call human in the loop or, or reining the technology in to, to make uh, to make it uh, uh, do no harm and, and help people. So at Stanford, um, you know, some of our wonderful colleagues like uh, HAI Associate Director Rob Reich and uh, uh, computer scientist uh, Mehran Sahami and uh, policy scholar Jeremy Weinstein have been doing this incredible um, course on uh, technology and ethics. At Harvard, we have colleagues led by Barbara Gross who have uh, created embedded ethics and uh, I think this is a shift that, um, you know, when I joined Stanford as a faculty 11 years ago, there was no ethics class in, um, in computer science department. But now the students are demanding it, the, the faculty are teaching it, and we all try to, um, uh, you know, learn it ourselves and, and embed that into our research. Mm -hmm. Outside of higher education, uh, the, 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 the population I pay close attention to is American's youth. I think um, our the next generation coming up, Shalini, like you said, they need to understand this technology. They need to uh, be um, at the steering wheel of this technology, especially um, students from traditionally underserved and underrepresented community. So we started this organization called AI for All about six years ago with my former student, PhD student, Olga Rusakovsky and Stanford colleague, Rick Sommer. We, our intention uh, uh, or our motto is, AI will change the world, who will change AI? And the intention is to uh, invite uh, high schoolers across the nation to participate in the studying of AI. Uh, we focus on people of all walks of life, whether it's low income family students, racial minorities, uh, rural students. Mm -hmm. And it started at Stanford as a summer camp for high schoolers, um, as well as women. 
Um, it started as, as one university summer camp six years ago, but now it's becoming a, a nationwide nonprofit. Even in the COVID summer, we had 16 universities from Arizona to Georgia, California to Pennsylvania, um, with uh, students all over the country joining our programs. And I think that investment that we all can do, whether we're artists or technologists or legal scholars or, or, or English professors, uh, are, is so important to ensure the future of this technology is in the hands of people who are bilingual in both technology and ethics. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I love it. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to add on to that a little bit. I'm so happy to hear that work is being done and these kind of interdisciplinary conversations are being had. Um, to the Stanford community, I just want to say you have immense power. And what I realized in the making of this film, facial recognition is sort of um, the most visceral, the thing that is easy for public audiences to understand. But what I really learned in the making of this film is that AI is going to totally transform everything I care about. Um, mm -hmm. Information, uh, access to education, uh, who gets hired, what quality of health care someone gets. Right. Um, everything we love, everything we hold dear as citizens of a democracy is going to be transformed by AI. AI. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so important that we have a dialogue that is much more inclusive historically than it has been, and that there are people at the table that understand more than just AI. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And I actually love that I see these things happening simultaneously. So oftentimes, I love the idea that we're not just going to come belatedly to these topics that you 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 get educated in one thing and then oh the technologists have to remember ethics is like something is you and and so and also that artists have a role to play in that as well that we should not preemptively remove ourselves from the conversation and you know that k-12 through thing is interesting because that's often a canard of the pipeline oh i don't know hand bringing where are these people what can we do and i think that that's hugely important um, that we're growing um, people, just as you said, I like the expression bilingual, multilingual, um, who feel that they have the authority to engage um, multiply as well. And I know Fei-Fei's talked a lot a bit about the elite, I'm not gonna say elitist power of Stanford. This is a place where we can incubate those things and have a responsibility to them too. Um, we just have a couple more minutes. This is so engrossing that I just want to sit and listen to the two of you together. I just we were all having a drink together and sitting around the fire. Is it's just it's <laughs> lovely. I'm so glad. I just want to say in advance, in case we all get cut up, having these more intimate conversations between the three of us, even as we recognize it's a national debate within more stakeholders have to be involved in it, is so important. You know, Shalini, you said the importance of having people at the table, but I actually also think what Fei Fei sort of tried to imagine too is. We don't just want someone to pull the door, a tape, a chair out. You know, we're going to upend the table. Like it's going to look different. That <laughs> setting is going to be different. So, and I think that's the that's the hope. This is a question that came up, and it spoke to me, even though it's a little out of cycle. But I really appreciated. This is a humanist question, I think. The attention to history in the film, because so often conversations about tech is associated with hurtling us into the future. Um, but there's a lot in the film about it, that data is destiny, that the past is embedded in our algorithms. And I'm a James Baldwin scholar, so I always like the idea that he talks about the past is animating our um, our present. And of course, but as, as Fei-Fei mentioned too, and also Shalini, you know, a lot of the predictive, especially judicial systems actually um, will script somebody's future basically and, and their present. And I think, um, one of the, the concerns that I saw in some of the questions was how do we make sure that the algorithmic use, which as you said, could be so totalizing and is taking over so much. And I like that you said off things you care about because it, opting out is not always an option, even though at the end of the social dilemma, it's just turn it all off, but it's pretty hard. Um, how can we make sure it doesn't um, script our future. It doesn't over overdetermine our past and present. Maybe it's just those, that conversation about regulation. Maybe it's what Fafi was suggesting too. We're mutual. We're educated in this, so we're not. It's not a fear of loss of agency. Shalini, you're smiling. What do you I'm think? Smiling because I'd love to hear what Fafi says because. I'm not actually convinced that um, there was a, an effect show, Alec, uh, Alex Garland's uh, a show devs, where it says the people who are predicting the future can't know so little about the past. Mm. And, um, and so 
I actually have real questions if we can use these algorithms based on data from hist from histories that yeah. we know have been systematically unequal to program the future. And um, whether that just puts us in a loop of determinism mm. that will prevent us from making afraid. social okay, I'm framing the question, Shalini, now you have to answer it. <laughs> is it <laughs> you cannot? Is it the sense that like, that's just uh, from, from what I when I saw I know, problems, even when technologists have the best of intentions, when Amazon wants to make a, an algorithm that will be not gender bias, but the data shows who's been hired and who's been promoted, and it goes. Or when Apple has a credit score, but women haven't had a, a long history of owning houses or credit right. owning credit cards. And so the Apple algorithm gives them a different, um, Steve Wozniak's wife, a different credit score when they have all the same exactly. assets and income. So I am not convinced, and I'd love to hear what Faye Faye says, yeah. that actually this way of predicting of the future can, can, can lead us to social progress. So um, I still feel this is one of those really nuanced and, and important mm -hmm. issues that we need to get multi-stakeholders. I, I totally hear you, Shalini, if we just propagate the historical prejudice in, in the data, it's not helping anybody. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, there are different aspects of this, uh, this uh, uh, problem and how do we, how do we, continue, as Michelle says, the innovation of this technology um, while making sure the guardrails are, are there, right? There are data, for example, some of the data we use are, are digits, you know, handwritten uh, digits. Um, uh, that's very different data from uh, healthcare record of, of people of different communities. So um, there's so much nuance and so much need for um, this kind of multi-stakeholder conversation and approach that uh, uh, one thing I want to focus and, and also thank people like you, Shalini, is that, um, you know, even myself, I find I'm not necessarily the best communicator of my science because I'm trained to do science and math and coding. No not necessarily trained to tell stories and, and effectively communicate. Yet there's so much needs for, for people like you and Michelle to translate what this technology and its impact, whether it's good or bad or you know shaded um, in all colors uh, to the public, to the policymakers. And uh, we just have to have these happening to all of us and thank you for coming to our field and and diving into things you didn't know and and translating that into a narrative and and for people like me to continue to listen to you and to your community to to hear there are certain things i take for granted that spoken from your perspective i realize Wow, for example, I never think computers are powerful. <laughs> for me, it's just, you know, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. I know how stupid computers are. Well, and then they, when I hear from, uh, from you, I, I recognize there is, for someone who don't code in computer language, of course it feels powerful. And, and we need to hear from each other and learn. I think so. you're, 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 there's so much humility in you, Fei Fei. I think you do more than just listen to. We've had conversations about you don't just enlarge the data set or enlarge the histories. There's different ways of telling history. There's different groups whose histories have been omitted, who haven't necessarily been heard. So it takes you right to those social questions of equity and justice that you're already alert to. So I, I know we're, we're winding up now. I just want to thank both of you so much for your willing to engage not just with me and hi, but also with each other. Um, we're just so grateful for this kind of conversation. And and thanks also to the audience for also everybody who helped um, put this together, both in high and together films as well. There's been a lot of work behind the scenes to be able to showcase and have this conversation. So uh, much gratitude and I look forward to many more conversations um, in these intimate settings and then also at the national as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Shalini. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, audience. <laughs>